Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Choices, Finding Your Joy. Paula Vale here. So happy to have you with us today. I'm just so grateful every day for the amazing people I connect with, and I have the opportunity to share with all of you. I'm thrilled today to share with you Chris Bush. He has been called the Dr. Phil of Millennials and the Malcolm Gladwell of Happiness. He has written this amazing book, The Millennial's Guide to Making Happiness. I just love it, I just love it. And Chris has just an amazing background and story to tell. I just wanna welcome you, Chris, and thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Paula, it's a delight. I just love it, I just love it. Let's begin with a bit of your background. What triggered you to go into this arena? I mean, I understand you had this great job, great paying job, and you went, hey, no, I'm going to do something different, and you end up writing a book. Tell us about all that. It's so fascinating. Yeah, I uh, grew up in a cushy private school bubble. I uh, went to Vanderbilt University for undergrad and got a fantastic job out of college. It's worth mentioning, it's a very healthy, loving family growing up. Uh, got this fantastic job out of college, working for Epic in healthcare IT project management. So I found myself as a 23 and a half year old, making great money, surrounded by loving family and friends, with a cool car and a great apartment with this wraparound balcony. And despite all of the stuff and the American dream I had achieved for myself, something was lacking, something was sorely missing. It was like uh, my, I built this beautiful cake out of my life. I prepared this beautiful cake and I forgot the baking soda. Something was missing. So when the cake came out, it was totally flat and tasteless. And I thought, what is wrong with my life? Uh, and I went to see some mental health counselors and to my surprise, I was diagnosed with acute clinical depression. So for me, I'll, I'll never forget the moment that my psychiatrist cut me off mid-sentence to prescribe me five milligrams of Wellbutrin. Basically, sorry you're unhappy, here's some drugs. Go join 10% of America and take a depress, antidepressant every day. Mm -hmm. And I heard this just before my 24th birthday and thought, I, I can't live a life on antidepressants. There must be a better solution than what society is offering me. So that inspired me, rather than to take drugs, why don't I learn about what the problem is? Why don't I just study happiness and better understand how to build a fulfilling life using anecdotes, using beautiful stories, but more importantly, using science? Because we're, we're just on the cusp of this mental health revolution where scientists are beginning to understand exactly what depression and happiness are. So we can use this stuff today to begin building a much more happy, fulfilling life. Yeah. Now, I'm using this stuff. I'm reading like crazy. I'm, I'm reading like uh, all these positive psychology books, all these amazing articles coming out of neuroscience labs, Emory, Stanford, Yale, all of these global and longitudinal studies uh, about the nature of happiness, all of this amazing science. And I used it, I converted all of the results into actionable life steps that I implemented in my life without making really any drastic changes. And Paula, within about five months, I went from the lowest point in my life to the happiest and most fulfilled. What, you know, that just shows what is possible for each yeah. of us. It was just, it blew me away how effective this stuff is once you really, once you understand your mental health and your happiness in the same way you understand your body and nutrition, then it completely changes your life. Now, I hit a crossroads. The first crossroads was when my psychiatrist started giving me pills, and the second was when I, I first broke the news to my friends because I was surrounded by, you know, again, loving friends and family, but none of them knew that I was depressed. I was almost ashamed to admit it because when you're a millennial, Everybody on their Facebook looks amazing and happy all the time. So who's going to step forward and say, yeah, I've got this job and friends, but I'm actually still really depressed and I don't know why. 
that was a, that would be a really scary leap, especially if you don't know where the help is going to come from. Mm -hmm. So once I'd already gotten to the point where I felt really confident that I was so super happy now, that was when I felt comfortable going to my friends and saying, Hey guys, I was actually really depressed. I actually remember the night it happened uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, the standard unit of alcohol isn't a pint. It's a giant glass boot. <laughs> so you go out with your friends and it's how you stay warm in Wisconsin. You go out with your friends and you order for a table of 10 or so, you order three glass boots, two liters of beer each, and you pass the boots around. Now the rule is you are never allowed to put down the boot on the table. It never touches the table. That's sacred oh. law. And the boot gets around to me and I gently put it on the table. And all of my friends just look at me like this. I've broken the code. Mm -hmm. And I said, guys, uh, I have something I'd like to share. Um, if you've noticed me being emotionally distant lately, and then maybe if I haven't been a good friend, I apologize. It's because I've been really depressed lately. But it's totally cool. What I've actually done is I've learned all this science and used it to build a happier life. And now I'm much better. So, hey, hey guys, I'm back. So they, they kind of looked and furled their brows, like, oh, okay. And then, you know, we picked the boots back up and, oh, cheers. And we kind of continued about our night. But within two weeks, most of the people at that table came forward to me privately and said, what did you do? Because I'm feeling, I think I'm feeling really depressed too. And I haven't really known what to do about it. So at that point, I wondered, well, first I wondered, does my employer have a morale problem? But then I took some time off work to travel up and down the country and talk to young people and say, hey, it seems like you have a pretty good life on Facebook, but are you really happy and fulfilled? What can I learn from you? Or conversely, how can I help you? And as it turned out, this, this seems to be a, a countrywide, a nationwide epidemic that the millennials are suffering from depression and unfulfillment. That's a serious problem. You've got 84, bright, 84 million bright-minded people that uh, aren't really sure how to build mental health, how to maintain their mental health, and how to be happy and fulfilled. And these are our future politicians and parents. So that was when I realized what I've learned, what I've stumbled upon, the science, can really help some people. And that's why I wrote everything I learned into the book. Oh, I love that. I love that story. And I, and I have to share something about Madison, Wisconsin. That's hilarious. That makes me laugh. My oldest son lives in Illinois. And I went to visit. We went up to Madison for a couple of days. And we went in a bar. And I, and I ordered a drink. And it was like this drink for $1.99 special. And it was like this big. <laughs> Seen anything like it? Somebody said that's yeah. Wisconsin mom. <laughs> that's Wisconsin mom. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, too fun. Um, you know, I just love so much about your book. And uh, I'd love to talk about a couple things that I read in there that I loved. And one was you said life is a highway. Tell us about that. What do you mean by that, Chris? Yeah. It's so life is a highway. We're all driving cars on the highway of life. And I, I love returning to this analogy routinely because we can identify with cars. And I, I love cars. It's kind of a secret passion of mine. And um, I find car analogies work well with happiness in a lot of ways. And I'll give you an example. With meditation, that was one thing I stumbled upon that completely changed my life in a way I would I'll do some of this and just maybe it'll calm me down no I opened up a watershed of crazy science about how meditation really affects the brain so I'll start with the car analogy what happens when you when a when bright-minded folks are born you effectively pull onto the highway of life and you're well, you're smart so let's say you're in a sports car you're in your old Mustang boss 302 Fun fact about Paula, she used to drive the coolest car in the world. So you pull onto the highway of life, you're in a nice sports car, and you put your foot down, and you just redline it, and your car's going me as you're driving for 25 years, like my friends have been, have been going through life like this. So just put your foot down, and that's like your brain. 
So our brains operate at this extremely high level all the time. Well, Paula, what happens when you put your foot down in your car and you leave it there for 20 years? Wow, it, you just go faster and faster. You go faster and faster, but what happens to the car? Oh, what happens to the car? Yeah, it breaks down, right? Yeah, needs, I mean, it, yeah. We all know that uh, carefully taking care of a car involves keeping the oil and the, the brakes and all of this stuff happy and optimized. Mm -hmm. The brain works in a very similar way. So when your car breaks down, what do we do? We take it to the dealership, right? Mm -hmm. When our brain starts underperforming, when we can't sleep, we can't focus, we have too much anxiety, these are all problems like a car mechanical problem. And the beauty of it is, what we found, what meditation does, meditation is the car dealership of your brain. If you can just pull off the highway of life for 15 minutes a day, you'll get this daily tune-up in your brain. So if things that happen, uh, you, your, your default mode network, your, the area of your brain response, basically your inner voice calms down, it calms itself down, it cleans itself up. Your, we've known for a long time in neuroscience that uh, the effect, there's this term called neuroplasticity, that your brain basically builds itself up until age 25 and then, and then it cuts off and concretes and that's the brain you have forever. Well, with meditation, what it does is it actually re-triggers that neuroplasticity process. So and the engineering squad shows up in your brain and goes, wow, we got some problems up here. We've got too much anxiety. We don't have enough memory. We're not sleeping very well. So boys get to work. So when you meditate, it re-triggers the neuroplasticity process in your brain literally moves gray matter around so you have a better operating brain. I love that. It's I unbelievable. So you look at brain scans online of meditators before and after, different brain. And I can say with confidence, this interview would have been way different two years ago before I started meditating. My memory, my articulation, my eye contact, my in this case, my webcam contact, much stronger because I literally have a better brain than I used to. So I felt so empowered by what the monks taught me. I learned meditation in a monastery. Um, I was so empowered by not only the feeling, but the calmness and this holistic life upgrade that meditation provides. And I'm the last guy in the world who should, who should know how to meditate because I'm the ultra hard charging German. We must get it done schnell today, today. It was really hard for me to sit down and listen to my inner voice and my thoughts. But once I got the techniques down and some beginner tips, I mastered the art pretty quickly. And now I operate on a mental level like I've never operated before. I was so inspired by this meditation practice that as soon as I left the monastery, I had my very first students. It was my, uh, my uncle Dave and my cousin Henry. Every morning while I was staying at their house, I would have them in their study and we'd meditate together. Mm -hmm. After three days, my aunt Laura comes over to me and she goes, I've ne never seen Dave this calm and relaxed in 30 years. Are, are you guys, what are you guys doing in that room? Are you, are you so weird in there? <laughs> We're meditating and I'll teach you too. So, since that day, I've trained probably 1,500 or so people how to meditate. I do Skype lessons. I do. I go into conferences. I go into corporate settings. There's. I just can't think of anyone that can't benefit from this stuff. And my approach is to go more into more detail behind the neuroscience and the posture and some beginner tips that this crabby old cranky German used to become a routine meditator. So it's just been a complete blast, a hugely positive journey, and I just. My favorite part about the whole thing is hearing my students come back and say, yeah, dude, you, <laughs> you rearranged my brain. I haven't slept this well in 10 years. Isn't that just so exciting? And it's, you know, the scientifics of it is so fascinating, you know, that that backs that up. And, you know, yeah. the meditation and, and myself being a Reiki practitioner, that really sets us back like meditation and that connection. And, and it's huge. What all of that does. I love it. And something I saw in your book that I loved was you talked about hug deficiency. And, uh, being a hugger, I love that. Tell us about that. 
Sure. So I, uh, during my happiness journeys, well, after I'd already studied all the science, I wanted to collect anecdotal evidence from the happiest, uh, most fulfilled people in the world. So I traveled and spoke to millennials and swamis and psychologists and monks and millionaires from 31 different countries. But funny enough, one of the most powerful conversations that I've had, the most poignant happiness classroom that I went to was a sweat lodge about 10 miles from my house where I'm sitting right now in Atlanta. That's run by this guy named Robert, uh, who's just the sweetest soul. He's a 60, he's 68, 69, but he could pass his 48. He just doesn't age. He ages like Keanu Reeves, which is to say not at all. And he's just this beautiful, calm spirit. And I went to the sweat lodge for the very first time with my bohemian step cousin, Hill. Uh, and I, it was admittedly one of those experiences where I, I was kind of reaching my, my boiling point where I was like, maybe I'm a little out of my comfort zone. <laughs> I've got flip flops on. I'm following my crazy cousin in the dark. I don't even know where we are or why we're here. And my, my cousin goes, he uses a phrase I'll never forget. He goes, don't worry, man. Just follow the scent of the scent age and just ran off into the darkness it kind of sounded like the hippie equivalent of when a hillbilly goes hey man hold my beer you no know? <laughs> we followed the sense of the sage we met robert and the sweat lodge was incredible it was like a little it was like a little it was a cross between a, a steam room and a hobbit house it's like a cute little door we go in there we did mindfulness exercises with robert and other people as we get out Robert comes out. He's been guiding us through these exercises. He goes, my brothers and sisters, how many of you have had 12 hugs today? Now we all come in here, like, you know, we don't, no, I didn't have 12. Oh, we only had eight. Uh, and he remains totally austere. He goes, my brothers and sisters, you are hug deficient. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You do not leave the sacred area of the sweat lodge until... You have had 12 hugs with each other. We thought, oh, okay, yeah, we'll all turn down a hug. So we turn and we're hugging each other, but I, I'm hugging these strangers that I've been through this wild experience with. And it's not like a, you know, like a, one of those awkward side hugs, the side hug you do when there's someone you don't really know or like that much. It was like we genuinely embraced each other. Yeah. And felt almost, I'm not a very spiritual person, but in this case, I made an exception. I almost feel your soul's touch. And, you know, somebody just hugs you for that long and whispers, thank you in your ear. It's something truly human and raw and beautiful about it. Yes. And I, I got it. I understand what Robert meant by I am hug deficient. Yes. I think it makes sense now that all these other cultures in the world are such huggers because there's so much beauty behind it. But from a physiological perspective, it does release serotonin and dopamine and it connects you with people to hug. Mm -hmm. So if I were to wrap up some, uh, some takeaways from this talk, one of them is start hugging people. People will be receptive. Most people will be receptive to hugs. Yeah. So just start hugging and hugging. Most people are. And I've always been, a hugger fan. I love hugs. I just, I think I've always loved them. And when I met my husband, I was running my restaurant and I told him right off the bat, I hug everybody. You're going to see me. I hug men all the time. It's innocent, but it's what I do. And I always will be. I just, I hug everybody. Men, yeah. women, kids. Hugs are great. It's like a handshake of the soul. It is. It is. It just, a more loving, caring, personable, you know, action other than a handshake. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, with reading your book, Chris, I mean, it's the millennials guide and I think it's so awesome, but I really believe this book will help anyone, you know, millennial or not, you have so much fantastic information in there. Yeah. That's actually the most common feedback I receive is, um, People ask me, why is millennial in the title? This is positive psychology that anyone can benefit from. And, you know, I'm 68 and I laughed at all your goofy stories. And the answer is, I wanted there to be a book, a, a happiness book specifically for my generation. Even if everyone can benefit from it, I really wanted millennials to pick it up because we are the future of this country and this world. 
And if we understand this science as a 21-year-old, man, with 60 years of your life with this in, in your noggin, knowing, making the right decisions every minute of every day to build more happiness, fulfillment, and longevity in your life, man, I mean, the, the impact of that is just immeasurable. I mean, imagine, and not only that, if we live more mindful lives as young people, then our offspring spend their entire lives with this stuff. It'll completely change the face of the world. We'll have mindful politicians, mindful engineers. It, I, I just feel, I almost, it's almost ironic. I have a chapter in here about sleep, why it's important, and um, why it's like a car wash for the brain. And it's almost ironic that I lose sleep because I want to get this message out to so many people as fast as possible. I love that. A car wash for the brain. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. How did you come up with that analogy? That is, that is awesome. I love that. Yeah. So what sleep does, I often get asked what's the difference between sleep and meditation. If meditation is the going into the dealer, getting a tune up on your brain, uh, again, uh, sleep is a car wash. When your the cells in your body produce waste and in most of your body, it has a system for getting rid of that waste. Uh, your brain doesn't. Your brain is way too compact, so the waste just sits there. So when you sleep, what happens is this a fluid called cerebral spinal fluid gets to the top of your brain, and it washes out like a like a street sweeper. Just washes out all of the uh, gunk, literally, from your brain. So you wake up the next morning with nice, clean, crisp neural highways. Um, in fact, the the buildup of the protein amyloid beta, it's a cell waste, it's um, between brain cells is what causes Alzheimer's. So when you, when you don't get enough sleep or if you fall asleep when you have too much alcohol in your system, um, the cerebral spinal fluid can't really do its job and you quite literally wake up with a dirty brain full of garbage. So get some sleep, kids. Wow, I love it, I love it. So getting that sleep, cleanses that it's exactly right it's a beautiful power wash for your uh, hard-working brain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know you you did you did so much research Chris and you know you interviewed Millennials from 31 countries I can only imagine how much you took in and what you learned and how fascinating that is yeah what an adventure once again, I, the most poignant moment of my entire journey, it was, a, it was a nervous leap for me because the Bushmen, my, my granddad is a renowned cardiologist in St. Louis. My dad is one of the top commercial real estate loan officers in the city. And there's me, and here I am, just very successful at my first job out of college, promotion offer on the desk, and my dad gets a phone call from me. <clears throat> saying, hey, Dad, I'm going to turn down my promotion and quit my job and travel the world to study happiness. Not really sure what that means yet or what I'm going to do with it. Now, for a dad who, you know, in a high-performing family that invested a lot, I'll admit, into private school education, a lot of dads wouldn't really receive that message very well. Mm -hmm. But it's a testament to my dad and the loving uh, relationship, the trusting relationship we had that he trusted me to put all the backbone and effort that I put into getting myself to that point, just re reorienting that effort towards a way I can help people. Mm -hmm. And with that trust, you know, gave me lots of freedom to, to travel and to find out where I need to be. And it was a little nerve wracking for a while there because here I am studying happiness, but what if I don't find what I need? What if people won't talk to me? What if I'm not, I haven't been validated in this idea yet, right? Yeah. So I'm about, about four or five months into my journey after leaving my job. And that was when I was trying to meditate on my own. It was just awful at it. I couldn't get it done. I, didn't, I just didn't know what I was doing. I jumped in the deep end. And it does require some brief formal training. So that's when I moved in with the monks. I stayed in a monastery called Magnolia Grove based in Beatsville, Mississippi. Because, you know, everyone knows if you want to find Vietnamese Buddhists, you go to Mississippi. <laughs> so, 
So I'm in this monastery, I'm studying with the monks, and they operate it like an Airbnb. Anyone can come hang out with them, and the beauty of it is they treat you just like a monk. So one morning, uh, they hand out tasks. Everybody has to pull their own weight. Um, Brother Harmony is going around the circle handing out tasks. He goes, Sister Ocean, would you mind rearranging the pebbles in the garden? Uh, uh, Brother Pham, would you mind cleaning the meditation cushions in the meditation hall? And he gets to me and he goes, Chris, do you know how to operate a chainsaw? <laughs> what, did you, what did you say to me? So, yeah, yeah, I had chopped down a tree and chopped it into wood for the for firewood for the woman storm. Um, but while I'm there, there anyone can go. So there's a 15 year old boy there named Kian. Now Kian was suffering from PTSD because he was beaten at school by bullies, and then his dad beat him when he got home. So he had no escape. Poor guy. Uh, but the monks allowed him to move in indefinitely to find some peace. Well, one morning. Kian sees me typing on my laptop and he sees the title of the book and sees Millennial's Guide to Making Happiness. And you know, at that point, the book is probably 70% done. And he goes, oh, that looks great. Can I read it? Now, you don't ask a German if you can experience something before it's done. The Germans, it has to be perfect before anyone sees it. Paul shows the car, I have a right, it's a perfect book. It would be perfect, no one will see it beforehand. So my response to Kian is, not yet, because it's just not ready. Well, he insists. He goes, I really want to read it. It sounds cool. Okay, so what I do is I have the Word document open. I pull out one little segment that I'm proud of that is ready. I pull it out to another document, and I hide the rest of the book. So I give a key in my laptop. He starts reading it. And Brother Harmony comes over and goes, would you guys like to go on a morning mindful walk where you just walk at half pace and enjoy nature? I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I go with Brother Harmony, and uh, Kian decides to stay. Well, I come back, and Kian is poof, he's gone. He's just disappeared. Laptop's gone, too. I'm like, oh, boy. Uh, and there's no Wi-Fi for any teenage boy shenaniganery, but you know, we don't really think much of it. Well, we don't see Kian for about 11 hours. It's getting to dinner time, and we're making vegan sushi that night. Well, I walk over, I tell Brother Harmony, have you seen Kian? No, I haven't. So we put on our boots, we're going to walk to the guy's dorm. Before we do, Kian appears in the doorway. He's got my laptop tucked under his arm, it's covered in a little bit of snow, and his face is bright red with emotion. He looks me in the eye from across the cafeteria. He puts my laptop down, and he rushes over and gives me the tightest hug I've felt in my entire life. And he goes, uh, I'm sorry, but I dug through your files and I found the rest of the book and I read the whole thing. And Chris, it's the first time that I've laughed and felt hope in six months. So that, that was my third turning point um, when I knew I was onto something and I, 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 I'd helped, truly helped somebody. Yeah. Um, there's just... You, you can't, I'm sure you've had this feeling, you just can't describe the feeling of taking a leap to try something new and getting that validation back that yes, what you're doing is working and you're helping people. Uh, I just didn't quite feel at my last job that I was helping people and that I was doing my purpose. Again, my cake came out of the oven flat and tasteless. Uh, so I finally had found the baking soda in my life. What you're baking now is beyond words. And, yeah. and I'm afraid we, gosh, I can't believe time has flown by, Chris. This has been so fantastic. We have about one more minute. What last words would you like to share? This has been so fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, I want to share that the number one takeaway from the first half of the book is to understand the difference between pleasure and true happiness. There are things designed in our society to make you feel good for a short period of time. Coca-Cola, Netflix bacon burgers, uh, fast cars, I admit. These are things that you, you have to recognize that things will, those things are temporary. Be sure to balance the diet, your mental happiness diet, with the things that last longer. Relationships, number one, philanthropy, travel, learning, physical and mental health. Think of 
pleasures is the French fries of life and the fulfilling stuff is a chicken and broccoli. Always keep a balanced diet every day. That's the key. And before I go, if I may, I'd like to share just a little, some action steps so I can connect with the, yes, watch, everyone who's watching. My website is www.chrisbush, C-H-R-I-S-B-U-T-S-C-H.com. I'd love for you guys to visit, watch a couple of my videos, subscribe so I can share my newest findings with you between books. Um, I do offer meditation classes over Skype. I'd love to teach you. I guarantee you it'll change your life. And just thank you guys so much for watching. And Paula, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you so much, honey. Sending you a big hug. It's Who's back? So happy to have you on. You're just amazing. Thank you for all you're doing for others. And to the audience out there, thank you, everyone. Love, hugs, blessings. Chris, love, hugs, blessings. Bye, everyone. Bye, thank Chris. Bye, Paula.